Welcome to Case in Point, produced by the University of Pennsylvania Law School. I'm your host, Eleanor Barrett. In this episode, we'll be exploring the principles and problems of copyright law and where the field is headed. We're pleased to be joined today by Sham Balganesh, a professor here at Penn Law and co-director of the Center for Asian Law. Sham, let's start our conversation with an example to show some of the basic principles of U.S. copyright. Is there a recent case that comes to mind that might illustrate some of these points? Sure. Um, I think the monkey selfie case, which has been making the rounds in the news recently, is a good illustration. So let me start with that. A basic principle of American copyright law is that copyright protection attaches to an original work of authorship that is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Right? That's the actual language used in the statute. And that sentence actually embodies the basic requirements of copyright protection. So the work needs to be original. It needs to be a work of expression. It needs to be fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And very importantly, it needs to be a work of authorship. So the monkey selfie case is a very good example. Here's what happened in that case. David Slater is a wildlife photographer who goes around the world photographing species of animals, kind of your National Geographic style photographs. And on one particular occasion, he spent a few days, in fact, perhaps even a week or so, following a group of Sulawesi macaque monkeys. He got to know them, had them become familiar with him. And in the middle of the forest, one day he decides to leave his tripod on a stand. And this is as per his description. Leaves the tripod on a stand, sets it to auto zoom and auto focus, and then goes and hides in the bushes. One particular monkey, which eventually gets named Naruto, comes and starts playing around with the camera and looks at its reflection in the lens, starts smiling at the lens, and hits the shutter button, and takes a series of photographs, basically monkey selfies. Now the question that emerges is whether the photographs that have been taken are eligible for copyright protection. In a sense, they are original and creative. For instance, if I didn't tell you this story and you just looked at the photograph, you'd say, oh, this deserves to be in National Geographic. It was fixed in a tangible medium of expression, clearly was fixed in the camera in your regular way in which a digital camera captures a photograph. But the question was, was it a work of authorship? And the Copyright Office issued an amendment to its compendium basically saying photographs taken by a monkey are not eligible for copyright protection because they're not works of authorship. So the conclusion that the Copyright Office was indirectly making was that this photograph was taken by the monkey, not taken by David Slater, and therefore did not qualify as a work of authorship. So what this example really tells you is that copyright has a set of formal requirements, originality, it must be expression, it must be fixed, but there's also a set of less obvious requirements, such as the fact that a work of authorship needs to be a human work of authorship. That, I think, very, very succinctly captures what current American copyright law thinking is in terms of what qualifies for protection and what the requirements are. So you mentioned uh, that part of the response to the monkey selfie case was that the Copyright Office issued a pronouncement about what constitutes a work of authorship. Uh, can you explain a little bit about that process, and is that the final word in what constitutes copyright protection? So let me be very clear what I mentioned. So what happened in this particular case, as best as I can tell, was that there wasn't a direct statement from the Copyright Office to David Slater. What happened was, around the same time, the Copyright Office was amending its rule book called the Copyright Office Compendium. And there, under Section 311, I think point two, it says that a work of authorship requires a human component. Only human authorship qualifies as a work of authorship. And so as an example of a work that doesn't qualify for authorship, they say specifically a photograph taken by a monkey. So putting that together with David Slater's own description of the facts, a lot of news outlets and, and professors have concluded that his was the paradigmatic case of what the Copyright Office was seeking to exclude. But Eleanor, your question raises another very important point that actually is critical to copyright law and distinguishes copyright law from patent law and trademark law, and it's the following. Copyright protection does not require 
registration with the Copyright Office. Copyright protection comes into existence automatically the moment a original work of authorship is fixed in a tangible medium of expression. Now, the law does provide you with some benefits when you register it, which is why one would be advised to register it under many circumstances, such as certain kinds of remedies. And the law also says before you file an infringement lawsuit, you need to register it with the Copyright Office. And as part of that process, the Copyright Office will then review whether the work has complied with the formal requirements of the statute. But as such, for protection, if you were to write something on a piece of paper or if you were to create a piece of art that satisfies the originality, the fixation, and the expression components of copyright law, you do not need registration for protection to commence. Okay, well thank you. Now that we understand the basics of copyright protection and what works qualify for copyright protection, can you help us understand how the broader system works? And in particular, what is copyright infringement? That's a term um, that we often hear about and that seems to be the crux of a lot of these disputes that are in the news about copyright issues. So copyright infringement is connected to copyright protection in a rather fundamental way. When we say that a work obtains copyright protection, what it effectively obtains is a set of exclusive rights, or the author obtains a set of exclusive rights to do certain acts in relation to that work once it becomes eligible for protection and obtains protection. So those exclusive rights are the exclusive right to reproduce the work, the exclusive right to distribute the work, in certain instances, the exclusive right to display and perform the work, and in some instances, the exclusive right also to adapt and make derivatives of the work. Um, copyright infringement, in essence, is a situation where someone, without the authorization of the author, does one of these acts covered by the exclusive rights granted to the author. Okay. So to give you an example, sure. let's say you write a short story. Someone else comes along and makes a verbatim copy of the entire story without your authorization. It is a violation of your exclusive right to reproduce the work. Okay. That's what copyright infringement is. Now, having said all of that, the actual working of copyright infringement is far more complicated once we get into the functioning of the system. Because while I said the exclusive right to reproduce, what that implies is copyright infringement at a very fundamental level. In this applies across the board to most of copyright's exclusive rights, requires an act of copying. So a violation of the reproduction right, most of the times the violation of a derivative right as well, and the violation of the public distribution right, requires an act of copying or the making of a copy. But what it means to copy is not as simple as it may seem. So copying, as the copyright system has come to understand it, involves both a factual component and an evaluative component. So let's go back to your short story example mm -hmm. for me to illustrate what exactly this means. So let's say the person comes along and copies 70%, the first seven out of the 10 page short story, copies it verbatim. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, was there copying for it to be a violation of your exclusive right to reproduce the work? So. That involves two questions, the copyright, the copyright system says. First, to figure out whether when the person made copies, they actually took your work and reproduced it, mm -hmm. quite, quite literally what we understand sure. as copying. Or did that person really sit in isolation on a deserted island and write the exact same short story? Very, very low probability, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. right? That is something called independent creation. Okay. When there's independent creation, there's no copying, and so there's no infringement. Right? So the first thing that needs to be shown for copyright infringement, especially for an exclusive right of reproduction violation, is that there was what we call factual or actual copying. Okay? And so you can rely on all sorts of evidence for this. The, the ones that are most prevalent are access to the work. Right? So if you wrote your short story and hid it away, then for someone else to have copied it seems very, very unlikely. Right? So, and, and that makes the, the, the isolated, deserted island example a little more probable, sure. especially when you hide it away. So access to the work is the first thing. The other thing that courts look for is circumstantial evidence. Mm -hmm. And what's the principal circumstantial evidence? Similarity between the works. Sure, of 
Of right? So, so if the works are so strikingly similar, mm -hmm. if the seven pages that are alleged to be infringing are identical to the first seven pages of your short story, an inference can be drawn, coupled with access, that factual copying has been satisfied. Well, it seems to me that there have been some cases in the news where there's been some talk about similarity between, mm -hmm. particularly in the music business, between new songs and old songs. Is, is that what you're talking about? That's exactly what I'm talking about. Right? And those cases get complicated but because I haven't gotten to the second step. Okay. So the first step is, in some ways, the easy Just one. It's on its face. Do they exactly. look the same? Or do, do they, they, do they look the same, same? And was there access? Okay. Right? Remember, do they look the same only for the purposes of drawing a circumstantial inference of sure. copying. Okay. Right? That's the first thing. Do they look similar enough that we might say, circumstantially, I think mm -hmm. that they're so similar I can draw an inference of copying when there is also proof of access. Okay. Right? That's sort of a factual and is that question. Just a, I mean, you say it's a factual question, uh, but there's obviously some judgment involved. Um, who gets to make that judgment, or where does that judgment happen in the, over the course of a litigation? Well, it's a factual question in the sense that ordinarily judges are allowed to decide this on a motion for a summary judgment. Okay. But it is also given when, when the facts themselves are disputed, for instance. Sure. Is the similarity sufficient to draw a inference if the parties are disputing that, or if there's a significant factual dispute over access? Mm -hmm. That obviously has to go to the jury as well. But that's, that's actually Eleanor, the simple part of the copyright infringement analysis. Oh, tell, well, tell us about so, the complicated part. So the complicated part, part is, is the mystifying part, so to speak, which is after this first step of factual copying or actual copying, then the dispute is handed over to the jury, where they have to determine something called substantial similarity. Okay. So here's what the substantial similarity question is, analytically. It involves handing over to the jury the question, all right, even if there was factual copying, was that copying enough as a qualitative and quantitative matter to rise to the revel, level of improper or wrongful copying? Right? Now you see what's happening. Sure. You're now making the jury assess the two works for their similarity, not to draw a factual inference of copying, but instead to say the copying is so much that I think it is infringement. Mm -hmm. And this is considered a question that is to be handed over to a lay jury. So the way in which the test is set up, you hand this over to the jury to determine, and it's somewhat of a black box. Right. Because the jury instructions don't say, what are the criteria that make something wrongful? Is it purely numerical? Is it the 60% threshold? Is it that the chorus of a song was taken? Is it that the background of two artworks was copied? The jury has to make that evaluation on well, its own. Well, juries make difficult evaluations all the time. What is it about this particular question that seems, it sounds like it sounds problematic from mm -hmm. your perspective, mm -hmm. and what is it about this particular determination? Who would be better qualified than a jury? I mean, it seems like a little bit of a um, kind of you know it when you see it sure. test, which seems like something that's perfectly suitable for a jury. So what is it that's so problematic about well, this? Well, the thing that is most problematic about this, if you think about it, is there's no guidance for future authors. One of the things that the copyright system is trying to do is determine the permissible limits of copying and taking of works for future creativity. Large swaths of creativity today involve taking other people's work, taking work that's in the public domain, taking works that exist, and converting them into new and original work. What this test does not provide is sufficient guidance to someone to figure out how much is wrong. Mm -hmm. When does something rise to the level of being improper or wrongful? So who should make this determination? In my view, a judge. Because one of the things that a judge is compelled to do that a jury never has to is write an opinion. Right. And an opinion, once memorialized, stands as guidance to future actors, future plaintiffs, future defendants who can decide what to do. So let me give you another example. You talked about recent cases which have been in the news about this sure. complexity. The blurred lines verdict is okay. one of them, right? which, is, okay. which has been in the news about copyright litigation in the music industry recently. Right. So what happened in that case? Well, the billboard topping song by Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke um, titled Blurred Lines um, is produced, and then the 
it's realized by the heirs of Marvin Gaye that one of his famous songs, Gotta Give It Up, sounds somewhat similar in its chorus and background. And they get in touch with Pharrell Williams, uh, Robin Thicke, and their um, studio to say, this could be copyright infringement. Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams, through their studio, file an action for declaratory relief to get a determination from the court that it is not copyright infringement. Now, all the evidence comes out of the process in which the work was created, and clearly, Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke knew of Marvin Gaye's favorite, famous song, right. and, and seemed to have even been fans of it. And so the question is then handed over to the jury of, all right, assuming there was copying, because there was access, and there is circumstantial evidence of similarity, was it enough to amount to copyright infringement? And they return a massive verdict saying yes. Now the problem with that is not that either Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke were in the right or that Marvin Gaye was in the right, or Marvin Gaye's heirs were in the right. What it was, was that we have no basis to know why the jury decided the way it did. Right, and it would seem that most of what Pharrell Williams does is probably along these lines. Uh, well, or many artists, you would think, they necessarily rely on references. You can think of across a number of fields. Mm -hmm. Fashion, where they're always talking about what people's reference points are. Exactly. Um, and, and so I see what exactly. you're saying. Exactly, and you know what? So, so all of this goes back historically to a test that was developed in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals by a prominent judge, a very famous judge, Judge Jerome Frank, mm -hmm. in a case called Arnstein versus Porter. Mm -hmm. And in Arnstein versus Porter is where the court sets up this two-prong test right. for copyright infringement, actual copying, and improper appropriation. Right? And that then gets absorbed into the Ninth Circuit in the 1970s, and most circuits basically follow this two-step approach. But when that standard was set up, the standard basically said, on the first step, the court can break down the work and look for its different component parts. And because the court may not be equipped to understand creativity in the industry, bring in an expert. Sure. And you can decide this first step on summary judgment when there's no dispute as to fact. Because if there's no copying, there's no need to impanel sure. a jury for the second sure. one. But for the second step, J Jerome Frank said, no expert testimony, no breaking down of the work, and you need to hand it over to a lay jury to determine. And that's the whole basis of this infringement analysis that we've continued for four or five decades since, which has resulted in this extreme confusion. Yeah, and I want to get to some suggestions for how to remedy this or some, some thoughts about moving forward. But before we do, it strikes me as we're talking that the two steps that you're describing seem almost repetitive of one another. So I, I'm curious, and, and maybe you don't know the answer to this, but I'm curious how often the jury comes back with a result that in some ways disagrees with the first step of the analysis, right? If, if the judge has already determined that the works are substantially similar for the first step of the analysis, it seems unlikely sure, so the, just so that you know, a jury, w the, and maybe I'm conflating a couple of points there, but what do you, sure. what do you so think? Sure, so I think it happens uh, very rarely, mm -hmm. right? Because um, normally when there is a dispute as to the first step of similarity, to get over factual right. copying, you can hand that over to the jury as well. Okay. Okay. And, and, and in my, my sense is that the second question is complicated enough right. that the way in which the jury may do it is to make a determination on the second step without going back to the judge sure. saying we sure. disagree with the first step. Right? You're, sure. and that's the, the, the complexity or the craziness of the black box of the jury process. Right. Right? And so that's, that's invariably what I think uh, would happen rather than the jury going back to the judge saying we disagree with the first step. In fact, here's an interesting thing. Um, I did some work with a couple of colleagues a few years ago. We were running a bunch of experiments on lay subjects to find out whether once you've told them that one thing is copied from another, whether similarity appears greater. Sure. Whether something appears more similar when you told them that it was They're, copied. They've been primed. And that's the answer was yes. That seems logical. Right. And so that's the way in which this plays out in the jury analysis. So step two is just handing it over to a jury without any instruction. So a lot of the commentary that came out of the Blurred Lines case was what really happened in this case? Some people complained that the jury was misled. Some people complained that the jury instructions were wrong. 
But the reality of it is we will never know right. because the jury's decision and what went into its thinking as a collective in terms of what specific level of wrong did the actions of Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams reach will never be known. The jury instructions were framed in terms of the legal standard. Mm -hmm. Does it rise to the level Without of Without providing examples about what's enough exactly, and what's not or, enough. Or specific criteria, right. right? So you can think of multiple criteria that one could mm -hmm. look at to figure out whether something is wrongful. One is a clear qual quantitative criteria, right? Mm -hmm. Is 70% of the work taken? Mm -hmm. For some people it may be 70, for some people it may be 50, for some people it be 95. But that's one way that's of thinking That's something about. a little bit more concrete. Right. But I'm, I'm not for a moment saying we go down that road. I'm just as an example of the sure. kind of criteria. Another one may be, oh, well, look at this work of the plaintiff. It is so personal to him or her that the defendant's copy, even though minimal, is such an invasion of the plaintiff's personality. Mm -hmm. That's another thing that may constitute right. wrongfulness in the jury's conception. Another one. Oh, look at the amount of time that the plaintiff spent to create this work. It took the plaintiff 400 hours to produce this work of art. Mm -hmm. And the defendant copied it in 12 minutes. That's not fair. Right. So all these considerations could potentially influence the jury. And the jury has seen evidence of how the work was created, the way in which the work came into existence. That stuff will come out in the open court. So the jury is likely to factor all of that into its determination of wrongfulness. And that's the problem with handing it over to a jury instead of keeping it with a district court judge who has to write an opinion. And when you write an opinion, it produces standards that future parties and future courts can rely on. Well, it's, so it sounds like that's your prescription here, is to make this more of a judge-guided rather than a jury-determined analysis. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think the prospects for that change are? And what are sort of the next steps or any future kind of upcoming developments in copyright law? Well, I, I'm not going to predict the direction of copyright jurisprudence, but, but here's where I think this change, if it is going to come, will have to come. It's going to have to come from courts. Mm -hmm. And here's the reason why. The very standard for copyright infringement, the Arnstein versus Porter standard, mm -hmm. was entirely a product of the federal courts. It was developed, and it has in the years since, been policed by the federal courts. What I mean by that is the infringement analysis standard does not find mention in the copyright statute. Mm -hmm. Copyright law is principally statutory in the sense that it originates from Title 17 right. and the Copyright Act of 1976. But there are many areas of copyright law that find no mention in the copyright statute and which have been produced by what I refer to as the federal common law of copyright, produced and managed and developed by courts so over just, the years. So just to be clear, the copyright law, the statute, does not prescribe uh, the standard that you're talking about for how to handle or how to decide an infringement action. Does it say anything about the standard for infringement? Nothing whatsoever, other than these are the exclusive rights and that if you commit an act that interferes with the exclusive right, it amounts to an infringement. So it defines what an infringement is and it tells you what the exclusive right is, but it doesn't tell you what exactly goes into the definition of copying. Right, that's what the infringement analysis, that copying is actual copying and evaluative copying, right. Right, that it needs to be improper appropriation, entirely a creation of the federal courts. And so that's the reason why I say if there's any reform, it has to come from the federal courts because they created the standard and they policed the standard. They've updated it for specific kinds of work. Mm -hmm. So for instance, with computer software, mm -hmm. they've developed a modified version of the standard called the Abstraction Filtration Comparison Test, which is structured because of the complexity of computer software. Right. It's not just as simple as comparing two photographs. But, but the reality of it is I would like district court judges and judges in general to pay, play a more active role. And here's the reason why. In, in a recent paper, I examined what went into the Arnstein versus Porter test. Mm -hmm. uh, went back and looked at some of the documents and the correspondence between the judges. Uh, Judge Jerome Frank, Judge Learned Hand, mm -hmm. and Judge Charles Clark, who were on the panel that drafted the Arnstein versus Porter test. And it was quite revealing because what it, what it revealed more than anything else was that the copyright infringement analysis standard was crafted by Judge Jerome Frank, not because of his belief that this was perfect for copyright law, but because of his 
I'm going to say it, somewhat myopic worldview of the role of district court judges. Mm -hmm. Judge Jerome Frank did not believe that these questions should go to district courts. He actually believed, he mistrusted district court judges. He believed that district court judges would manipulate legal doctrine to please appellate court judges who are reviewing their opinion. And as a reminder, Judge Frank was an appellate court judge. He was in the the exactly. Circuit. He was in the Second Circuit sure. Court of Appeals, and he was constantly reviewing district court right. opinions mm -hmm. on appeal. And so, and, and how I, this is most apparent in some of the books and articles he publishes around the same time of this opinion, mm -hmm. where he basically is saying district court judges will po post hoc rationalize their decisions, which are based on hunches. And it's much better to hand this over, these kinds of questions over to juries because of the subjectivity involved and the collective nature of jury decision making may be a better way of doing it. So he takes away, he basically the standard is structured in such a way as to take away from district court judges the power to decide everything on summary judgment. And Jerome Frank is also one of the biggest non-fans of summary judgment. He did everything possible to minimize the scope of summary judgment. Now here's the reality of it. In the years since Arnstein versus Porter, that myopic worldview has changed. Mm -hmm. Judges now exercise summary judgment on a rather regular basis. Most people in the federal judiciary recognize that judges have to play a more active role in motion practice and deciding cases on a motion to dismiss and, and summary judgment. And are there any copyright cases that are now decided on summary judgment, even at the second stage as well? On the second stage, or it's not very as much. Clear. Okay. On the second stage, in fact, there's, there, there's case after case where on the second stage, if there's a possibility for a reasonable disagreement, mm -hmm. appellate courts reverse district courts, even when a district court judge is willing to grant summary judgment on the second step, saying, oh, no reasonable jury could have found right. this to be wrongful. On appeal, we've seen circuit courts of appeal across the country saying, no, that should have gone over to a jury and panel a jury and have it decided. So, so no, even though we've seen that mindset shift right. on summary judgment, it hasn't this, really percolated hasn't the copyright this standard. infringement enough. That's very interesting. You said that you think that change maybe has to come from the courts, but is there any role for Congress to play here? Is there any role for um, adding some depth or specificity to the definition of infringement uh, within the copyright statute? So, so there are two answers to that. There's the theoretical answer and there's a pragmatic one, right? Exactly. So theoretically, sure. I think to the extent that copyright law is principally statutory in the sense of emanating from a statute, mm -hmm. Congress can always come in and play a role. But I think pragmatically, Congress has stayed away, uh, certainly if you look at the drafting of the 1976 Act, areas that have been well developed by courts, mm -hmm. right? And so it's been, what, 40 years now yeah. since the last codification, the last primary codification of the Copyright Act, and Congress hasn't intervened on those major aspects that were not codified, right. such as the infringement analysis. So I think pragmatically, it's unlikely that they're going to intervene because no copy, so here's the thing, even though the 1976 Copyright Act didn't codify it, none of the prior Copyright Acts either right. spoke about the infringement analysis. So I think now, several, several decades later for Congress to step in would be entering a minefield. Well, as you say, though, um, it seems that the real harm of this is that it doesn't provide enough guidance for creative people who are issuing new works that they hope to be protected by copyright. Is there any... Um, evidence of or any chance of some kind of bottom-up groundswell for better standards to help people, you know, like Pharrell Williams and Robin Thicke, who were slapped with this giant verdict for something that they probably thought was the ordinary course of business. So people have tried. Uh, I will say the area where that has come up more regularly is in the context of the fair use doctrine, okay. which is another important exception to copyright. In fact, the copyright statute says that something is not copyright infringement if it is fair use. So the provision of the copyright statute, which contains those exclusive rights that I mentioned, says subject to section 107, which is the fair use doctrine, the copyright owner has these rights. So fair use takes something out of the scope of copyright infringement. Okay, so operates like a defense. It, exactly, right? Except that the structure says that it would not be infringement okay. at all. Right, that's what the statute says, but it has been interpreted 
to be a defense by courts, by most courts. Um, but fair use is an area where the statute and the legislative history accompanying it say that, look, courts have developed this area over a period of time. We're not going to concretize it other than to show or to indicate in the statute what the four factors are as seen in the case law. And so Congress did what is best described as a soft codification. Sure. So they codified it in common law style, sure. recognizing it, that courts should be free to develop it further. Mm -hmm. Now, that has produced the same kind of open-endedness that we see in any judge-made set of rules. Mm -hmm. But that's discernible because it's decided by courts on a regular basis. Courts have to write opinions on fair use. Right. So you can actually discern a meaning for the different factors of fair use. Mm -hmm. You can actually look at the different case law and say, this amounts to fair use generally. This amounts to fair sure. use under this factor. This is how this factor should be analyzed under this jurisprudence. And in that context, what we've seen is scholars, artistic communities, other creative communities coming together to try and create standards mm -hmm. that would be of guidance mm -hmm. to artists and creators who are relying on fair use to produce additional creativity. We see less of that in the substantial similarity or the copyright infringement analysis context because we don't even have the basic guidelines of when something is wrongful to work with. Mm -hmm. So fair use is actually oftentimes called one of copyright's most problematic doctrines. I can say for sure the copyright infringement analysis is without question the most complicated analysis or the most complicated doctrine. Why? Because we don't even know what goes into it. We don't even know what it means. Exactly. That makes sense. And we have to guide juries. That's the irony. We don't know what it means, but the judge has to tell the jury, go decide. Okay, so we're talking about these jury verdicts that seem to come out of nowhere, and a recent one that's been in the news is in the copyright case between Google and Oracle. Uh, can you comment a little bit about that case and how it reflects on this issue? Sure. So, so that's an interesting case because that, to my mind, is one of the first, if not the only one that I can recollect. Um, jury verdict on the question of fair use. The jury in that case was given the question of fair use, not the infringement analysis, but the question of fair use under Section 107 of the Copyright Act to determine whether Google's actions in copying Oracle's work was exempted from copyright infringement under the four fair use factors. Mm -hmm. Now, that's an illustration of where, I think, the jury process could work better than in the infringement analysis. Why? Because the jury instructions can build on prior jurisprudence that has been developed by courts. So fair use is ordinarily decided on summary judgment. Right? It's decided by a court on summary judgment. And the reason this is such a rarity that what happened in the Oracle versus Google cases, we can't think of a single other case where fair use was handed over to the jury. So the jury instructions in that case are likely to be based on everything that a judge knows based on prior cases. And what the jury is asked to do is evaluate the factual evidence in light of those discernible standards where you can determine patterns. And that's what happens in or in, it happened in Oracle versus Google. Well, might the defendant in that case argue that the case should have been decided on summary judgment as opposed to being submitted to the jury? Or is that st so it went through multiple stages. Sure. And what really happened is that it went up to the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals and the Federal Circuit Court of Appeals, in its decision, said that fair use is a triable question and remanded it back to the lower court. So it decided the question of protectability for the plaintiff to say that the work is protected. Sure. And then sent it back on remand to the lower court to say, here's a triable question on fair use. Mm -hmm. And so I think the defendant did try making right. the claim that this case could have been gotten rid of at earlier stages. Sure. And that failed through the multiple steps. So what happened was a culmination of of, of a series of decisions and eventually it being handed over to the jury. Now, I will confess, my real hope is that fewer cases, even on fair use, mm -hmm. end up before a jury. I think it, it's a good thing that a case like Oracle versus Google is a rarity because the more you hand over things to the jury, the less we know about what goes into the decision right. and less guidance we have at the ultimate stage of figuring out what to do when you're relying on past precedent sure. to actually guide you. So right now we don't know what exactly it was that the jury held for each of the individual factors or what 
exactly influence their collective decision. Mm -hmm. We don't have an exit interview for right. jurors, right? right? So we're, we're basing it exclusively on the verdict. Mm -hmm. So yes, Google won in that case, but we don't know exactly why, unlike if it had been decided on summary judgment. Okay. Well, moving on from Oracle and Google, another case uh, that's been in the news has to do with Star Trek, I think. And I'm not a super fan, but I understand there's been some controversy uh, about Star Trek in, in the sense of another group of fans uh, wanting to use some of the Star Trek property and make it their own. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right. So it's an interesting case. Star Trek is one of those cult movies that has a mm -hmm. lot of fan following. And fans like to do things with what was in Star Trek, which I think has made Star Trek as a franchise uh, an enduring cultural icon. But what happened in this case was that uh, a group of fans decided to crowdsource some funding and make a movie that was in some ways a fan movie derived from Star Trek uh, called Axanar, I believe. It even has its own website. And what they did in this movie was have, have dialogue relying on the language that is well known in Star Trek, namely Klingon. Um, now, Klingon was a, is a language that is used by a set of characters in Star Trek, but it's actually a fully developed language that has been developed by someone else, and then the rights over the book in which it was developed of the kind were uh, assigned to Paramount. And Paramount, in this lawsuit, which I think is a bizarre lawsuit, brought an action for a variety of different things, but the bizarre part of it was that they claimed a copyright in the Klingon language as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a basic principle of copyright law, which is actually codified in the copyright statute in section 102b, which says that copyright protection is limited to the expression and not to a method, system, process, procedure, or idea. Okay. okay? So, the fans in this Axanar movie were not lifting dialogue, or as best as I can tell, were not accused of lifting actual dialogue from the Star Trek movies. But they were coming up with Klingon dialogue, relying on the Klingon, Klingon language that obviously had been made for the Star Trek enter right. for and, the Star and not using parts of the book, it sounds like not that was using published. Parts and, of the book. and it sounds right. like had they used the book or the specific language, that would be a little bit more problematic. Right. I mean then and then we get into the whole sure. thing of whether it was enough, but that wasn't even on the table. Right? right. The allegation of Paramount in this case was we have a copyright in the Klingon language. Mm -hmm. That was absurd. That was absurd, and I think that that's just not in keeping with basic principles of copyright law. I'm leaving aside for the moment all the other claims sure. that, had, that they had brought against Axanar for whether it was an unauthorized derivative work, use of their characters, and, and all of that. But that, to my mind, the Klingon claim was the most bizarre one. And it created, I think, rightly, a genuine public outcry where people are saying, you know, that's not how copyright works. And, and from what I understand, uh, Paramount has recently withdrawn the lawsuit. I think hopefully recognizing the absurdity of the claim under Section 102B, that you just cannot make a claim for the entirety of, of the, the Klingon language. language. All right, so well, Klingon speakers, uh, you're in luck, it sounds like. Um, okay, well, what else, what are some other interesting copyright issues that are bubbling up through the courts now? Are there other things that our, our listeners or our viewers might encounter uh, in the news or other things that are unsettled that are in the process of being defined? <clears throat> So um, a couple of interesting ones that I think will, will interest our listeners. So let's loop back to where we began, the monkey selfie episode. Mm -hmm. sure. The monkey selfie episode made its way into the courts. Why? Because PETA, uh, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, decided to make the claim, fine, if David Slater wasn't the author, the monkey was the author. Let's try and push copyright law to recognize the reality that animals have copyright and that human authorship is not a component. So in a lawsuit that I believe was titled Naruto, they gave the monkey a name, Naruto versus Slater, uh, they claimed, Peta claimed that um, the monkey was the author. And that was dismissed, mm -hmm. uh, I think rightly. Uh, that, that current copyright law does not recognize authorship by animals or by non-humans. Mm -hmm. um, this has been appealed to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. So we will, I think, see some interesting case law coming out on the question of monkey authorship okay. and poor Naruto's rights mm -hmm. on whether um, the clicking of the shutter button on the camera mm -hmm. 
by a monkey was enough to constitute authorship. That's one uh, in the Ninth Circuit. Another one uh, is, is a recent interesting case that I think has been uh, taken on by the Supreme Court, mm -hmm. which is this question of when is a functional component of a work of authorship ineligible for protection and when is it eligible for protection? So here's the principle that's at stake. Mm -hmm. um, a basic principle of copyright law contained in, in certain categories of works is that functional elements of a work are not eligible for protection. Right? So if you have you know, the design of something that is performing a useful function, mm -hmm. right? so let's say the shape of a handle that is designed in a certain way exclusively to allow your hands to fit it well. Mm -hmm. right? That's functional. Even though it may look really pleasing, right. if it was functional right, or useful, it's ineligible for protection. Now, the way we determine under copyright jurisprudence whether this is protectable or not is a test called separability. Not just physical separability, mm -hmm but something called conceptual separability, right? another complex doctrine. And so the Supreme Court has granted cert to determine whether concept, what conceptual separability means because there's a conflict between the different circuits on the test that they apply to determine whether something is conceptually in the mind separable. And what we're talking about is the separability of the aesthetic and the useful. Okay. And so that's, that's an interesting case that the Supreme Court has agreed to hear and they think the October term, and it'll make a decision next year. Oh, interesting. Well, we'll definitely keep our eyes out for that. And we've talked a lot about your work on um, uh, hoping to increase the role of judges in copyright law. Um, what other projects do you have coming up, or what else can we be looking for from you um, in this field? Well, so building on that theme, a lot of my work has focused on making the claim that Copyright law is developed in a symbiotic process between Congress and courts. Mm -hmm. And that courts have a really critical role to play in developing the direction and content of copyright jurisprudence. And, and the claim emanates from the recognition that Congress can't keep up with the, the kinds of creativity, right. the context in which creativity come up. And incremental or case-by-case -case decision making by courts is the way forward in this domain. So, so a lot of my work has been in that vein. I think some of these problems can be solved uh, in that exact method. So let me, let me again loop back to sure. the monkey selfie instance to, to tie it all together. So the claims that a lot of my work makes is looking to the common law, right, which is this body of law such as tort law, property law, contract law, that is entirely judge made, sure. is a useful way for copyright reform to think about development and movement in certain directions. The question of the monkey selfie, I think, highlights why the common law is a perfect way of thinking about these questions. So in the monkey selfie context, the real issue that we're grappling with is the question of human agency. Because let's be clear, even if we accept the facts of what happened in the monkey selfie case, the reality is that Naruto did not buy the camera. Right. Naruto did not set the autofocus or the auto zoom. Naruto did not station the tripod. Sure. And Naruto did not set the lighting effects. The photographer did all of that. Naruto pressed the button. And yet, we concluded, or the copyright system seems to have concluded, mm -hmm. that the photographer's actions were insufficient. It's not that a human wasn't involved. Right. It's that the photographer's actions weren't sufficient. What that effectively is, if we boil it down to basic legal principles, is it's a question of causation. We're basically saying that the photographer's causal imprint was not enough. Think of it this way, just a complete hypothetical. You go to a zoo, or you go into a forest, or you go into some other area where you see a group of monkeys playing, and you throw a grenade with its pin in, 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 still attached to those monkeys to play with. Well, let's assume the monkeys, being curious as they are, opens it out and there's a lot of damage to person and property. Would we hold the human being who threw the grenade in there responsible? Or would we say, the monkey pulled the pin? Well, the chances are we would say the human sure. being was responsible because it was foreseeable 
It was proximate. Absolutely. So the real question in this case, the monkey selfie case, is not that there wasn't a human being, is that we're making an evaluation that for copyright purposes, that amount of human agency is not enough. That is precisely a question that the common law has addressed for hundreds of years now sure. under the concept of causation. And courts have policed it beautifully. So for example, in tort law, we have two different steps. We say factual causation, cause in fact, and proximate causation. Absolutely. Where in the first step we ask, was it factually connected as a purely descriptive matter? And in the second step we say, all right, even if it was factually connected, in light of the purposes that we are trying to achieve, should we deem the connection enough? Right. That's what I'm trying to urge copyright law to do. Rather than to simply make simplistic statements, a photograph taken by a monkey is not eligible for copyright protection. What is a photograph taken by a monkey? Right. A How monkey likely is that to be replicated either? What's the underlying principle? That exactly. Gets into that? Right. And, and I'll tell you where determining something like that becomes really important as a matter of principle. Machine-made artifacts, sure. machine-made creativity, sure. robotic creativity. Right? Mm -hmm. So you write a computer program, and then because of its own set of randomized instructions, it produces creative expression. Should that be eligible? Well, we need to have a set of doctrinal and evaluative criteria to make that determination. Simply saying robots cannot create or monkeys cannot create right. is not the answer. And that's what my work is trying to do. So I have a, a paper called uh, causing copyright, which asks the question of how might we look to tort law's understanding of causation to map out and jump into the real evaluation that copyright needs to be getting at when it's dealing with the amount of human agency. It's just not a simple answer to say that the monkey did it, because that would not be a defense if you gave a monkey your gun and you trained the monkey to commit a crime. You couldn't say the monkey did it. You would have some responsibility. I think I remember this, this movie uh, from um, a, more than a decade ago, Dunstan Checks In, okay. right? which is where um, I think a criminal trains a monkey to commit uh, theft, and the monkey jumps through the windows of a hotel room mm -hmm. picking up artifacts. Mm -hmm. There's no question that when we're trying to find the person responsible, it's not a defense for the person who says, oh, the monkey did it. Right? Same logic here. Absolutely. Well, Sham, thank you so much. I really enjoyed our conversation today, and I really appreciate everything that you've told us about copyright law, the Arnstein test, and future developments. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure.